Me llamo Tupten Wangchen. My name is Tupten Wangchen. I am 45 years old and am one of the 130,000 Tibetans living in exile. I was four years old when my mother was murdered by soldiers during the Chinese repression in Tibet in 1958. A year later, my father, like thousands of other Tibetans, decided we had to escape from the country on a dangerous journey across the Himalayas, following in the footsteps of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. For six years, we begged our way around Nepal and northern India, until the Tibetan government in exile took me off the streets and placed me in a boarding school where I remained until I was 16, when I decided to become a monk. In 1981, I came to Spain for the first time to work as an interpreter in a Buddhist center. It's been 19 years, and I'm still here, where I'm in charge of the House of Tibet a foundation set up in 1994 by the Dalai Lama to spread and keep alive the culture and religion of my country. Here, I am free to express my ideas without fear of being tortured. Since the Chinese army invaded Tibet in 1958, Lhasa has been transformed beyond all recognition. The small feudal city, fabulous and forbidden, has been turned into just one more chaotic metropolis of cement and glass, like all other large Chinese cities, determined not to miss out on progress. Especially in the past 20 years, the major investors from the east coast of China have turned their eyes to this remote region rich in mineral resources, where labor is cheap and the local government offers enormous tax and social incentives, such as the fact that Chinese couples can have two children instead of the one, which is obligatory in the rest of the country. This economic boom, along with the advertising campaigns on national television stations to attract people here, have led to over 50,000 Chinese immigrating to Lhasa every year. And though few are given residence permits in order to keep down the official numbers, the reality is that half the population of the city is now of Chinese origin, making the Tibetans a minority in their own country. For soldiers too, Tibet has become a good place to be posted because here they can earn up to four times as much as in the rest of the country. Over half a million soldiers are stationed in this region and in order to overcome the prejudice that Tibet is a frozen desert inhabited by savages, the government encourages prostitution which has turned Lhasa into one of the largest brothels in Asia. The new settlements built by the state are not sufficient to absorb this growing immigration, and one of the solutions has been to expropriate the spacious Tibetan houses and divide them up into apartments, forcing the original owners to live alongside the Chinese, who in addition act as spies. Of the 16,000 shops registered in the capital, only 300 belong to Tibetans. Only the Chinese are allowed access to the best premises, forcing the Tibetans to sell their merchandise from street stalls. Dozens of cattle breeders and farmers arrive in the city every day, 
fleeing from the extreme poverty of rural areas. There, there are no schools or hospitals because there is virtually no Chinese population. All the state has done has been to expropriate land and cattle in order to be able to feed the enormous military population. The luckiest ones arrive with the little money they have managed to save and which will allow them to earn a living selling extremely low quality Chinese products. But the majority have no other option but to accept the hard work the Chinese refuse to do and in conditions of semi-slavery, building roads, bridges and electricity lines. Very few Tibetans are able to make a decent living in this totalitarian, oppressive society where human rights are simply trampled on. And so the streets of Lhasa are full of beggars and hustlers who survive on the few coins they receive from tourists. It is very noticeable that among these homeless, there are virtually no Chinese citizens. One of the most negative effects of this entire process is that the Tibetans are starting to doubt their own culture, at times even feeling ashamed of it. The old district of Barkor is the heart of the city, a Tibetan island in the middle of a Chinese ocean. The only place that has resisted the invasion of the modern world and where it is still possible to feel the magic and the atmosphere of what Lhasa used to be, the forbidden impregnable city and in the past a remote unreachable dream for many Westerners. At the doors of the tea houses, crowds gather to see the latest production from India some of them are seeing television for the first time. Meanwhile, the camper nomads finish their last game of billiards before they again return to the frozen expanses of the Tibetan plateau. In the workshops, the children carve in stone the Om Mani Padme Hum. Let us praise the jewel of the lotus, the most common of the mantras, the prayers to Buddha. Walking around the streets of Barkor, it's almost as if time had stood still. All around us are vendors and artisans, nomads, warriors and characters from legend, pilgrims who have come here from the four corners of the country to follow the most important pilgrimage route in the city. But there are virtually no monks. The majority have had to flee Tibet in search of freedom alongside the Dalai Lama. In the monastery of Sera, one of the most important in the city, before the invasion there lived there 5,500 monks of which now just 200 remain. The monasteries are emptying, becoming almost lifeless wax museums. A monk's most precious possession is a photo of the Dalai Lama which are completely forbidden here. If a soldier finds you, a foreigner with one, you will spend a few days in jail and will then be forced to leave the country. But if the transgressor is Tibetan, the punishment will be much more severe. The monks suffer the harshest repression and their peaceful demonstrations in favor of religious freedom are systematically quashed by the soldiers using excessive violence. One of the most bloody uprisings took place in January 1989 when the Panchen Lama was found dead just six days after having publicly criticized the mistakes committed by the Chinese government. The Prime Minister Li Peng decreed martial law, but the uprisings did not cease, and every day there were demonstrations demanding independence. The soldiers broke them up by firing live bullets, and in three days there were hundreds of wounded, and over 60 demonstrators were killed.
Prisoners are subjected to cruel torture, and in 40 years of repression, one and a half million Tibetans have died as a direct result of the invasion. It is difficult to find a family that has not had at least one member imprisoned or murdered. A study carried out by Amnesty International reveals that 70% of prisoners die as a result of beatings, hunger, and the brutal conditions of forced labor to which they are subjected. This man's name is Yeshi Togden. He is 33 years old and runs the Association of Former Political Prisoners in Exile. I was arrested on the 23rd of March, 1989, for participating in a peaceful protest against the occupation. That same day I was taken to Shanghip No. 4 High Security Prison, where I remained for six years. During my time in prison, I was subjected to all kinds of humiliations and tortures. They beat me so hard on the head that I lost the hearing in my right ear. For the first week, I was locked up with 22 other prisoners in a small cell, without food or water. We had to relieve ourselves on the floor, where we slept. Every night we could hear in the distance the screams of people being tortured. It was a nightmare. Yesi shows us some of the instruments used for torture. This torch was one of the most common. With it, they hit us on the head and gave us electrical charges on the most sensitive parts of the body, such as the testicles, the mouth, or the forearms. On the 14th of May 1995, Yeshi Togden was released. He had no other option but to escape into exile like thousands of his compatriots before him. This means a dangerous journey on foot lasting three weeks across the highest mountains in the world, sleeping during the day and traveling only at night to avoid being seen by the soldiers. The most dangerous part is the crossing of the Nampa La Pass, 6,000 meters up in the mountains. But on the way, there are many other dangers glaciers and turbulent rivers, avalanches and snowstorms. And they don't feel free until they've reached Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal. They know only too well that if they are caught by the Nepalese soldiers, they will again be handed over to the Chinese authorities and will probably never be heard of again. On the outskirts of Kathmandu stands the Exile Reception Center, a small building which provides physical and psychological attention. Here they also help them with the official procedures to achieve political refugee status. This group of seven girls and 12 boys arrived just a week ago. Their faces still reflect the arduous journey, but they are happy. They have reached freedom. The majority have suffered frostbite on their hands and feet, like this boy, who has had to have all his toes amputated. Economically, too, the price they have to pay is very high. Depending upon the guide also, depending upon the age of people traveling, if it's a young child, you know, like this girl, 11-year-old girl, they charge uh, 1,000 yuan, Chinese rupees, and otherwise 7 to 800 yuan per head, they charge. Uh, exit permit. Exit permit. They can stay here for seven days. In the courtyard of the little clinic, the nurses clean and dress the wounds. They almost all arrive with frostbite. They have to travel light, and the sports shoes and the few clothes they have with them are not enough to withstand temperatures that drop to 40 degrees below zero. Nima Tenzing is 11 years old. She can barely walk. 
an eloquent example of the terrible struggle to survive. And then she came in uh, 22nd of uh, January. And when she came from Tibet, on the way, these people been, you know, uh, 22 of them been badly frostbitten. When we were crossing the mountain in Nambala, a lot of snow, you know, one night, they stopped somewhere, the, the whole night started snowing, and the very next day they traveled in the snow for five days. And from the group of six, uh, 22, six, five people died, very young people, you know. They were frozen to death, frozen, you know, ice. They had no food for five days. They were eating only snow. And she was carried by one of the boys, and then, you know, the boy also got frostbitten. And then they couldn't walk for, uh, from uh, the, you know, the snow was so much. If they had been in the snow for another one or two days, they might have died also. So from the group, five people died in the snow. They slept in the night. Morning, they were just frozen, completely frozen. All these people are so strong, you know. Can you imagine ourselves, all these tools gone, you know? When she came, the tools were just hanging, you know. Uh, they are so strong, really. From Kathmandu, the refugees are transferred to the different Tibetan settlements in Indian territory. India is without doubt the country that most helps the Tibetan cause. Of the 130,000 exiles around the world, 100,000 live in India. The dream of all of them is to go to Dharmasala, Little Lhasa, the home of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Dharamsala is at an altitude of 1,800 meters in the foothills of the Himalayas. Until 1960, it was a peaceful mountain resort surrounded by pine trees and rhododendrons, where people led uneventful lives presided over by the perpetual snows of the mountain peaks. Traveling along the road to Dharmasala, we pass through Indian villages up to just a few kilometers before reaching the city. Then the surroundings suddenly become unmistakably Tibetan. Dharmasala is home to over 6,000 exiles, a third of the population of the town, who have come here in search of the values that have been stolen from them. They have adapted perfectly to their new home thanks to the altitude and the relative cool compared to the heat of the plain. They own the majority of hotels, restaurants, businesses and antique shops. Different religious and ethnic groups live peacefully side by side in this small area where Buddhism is the focus of everyday life as it was in Tibet before the Chinese aggression. At the end of July, the refugee reception center is almost full. Now is the best time to cross the mountains and in a few weeks this room will be full to bursting point. Once they have recovered, the different bodies the Tibetan government in exile has set up in the city will take care of finding them somewhere to go. For all these people, yesterday was the happiest day of their lives because they were received by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Some of them even dare to tell us why they escaped, knowing the danger this places their families in. I lived with my parents in the Chamdo region. One day the government took our land from us and we were forced to move to Lhasa. My father was unable to find work, so I had to start begging. One morning, three soldiers came up to me and, without saying a word, beat me so badly they left me blind in one eye. From then on, my only obsession was to get out of Tibet. Ninety percent, ninety percent these refugees coming from Tibet are from the, the uh, villages and the nomadic area where there is no school opened by the Chinese. Chinese have not opened schools in the villages and the nomadic area because there are no Chinese. So Chinese have opened schools, hospitals only in the cities where the majority are Chinese. 
So these refugees, 90% are illiterate. They don't know how to read and write, even Tibetan. Forget about Chinese or English. They don't know. They have never been to school. So when they reach here, we have to start from the very beginning, A, B, C, D, you know. And even we have to teach them how to clean your face and how to keep uh, healthy. Even they don't know this, you know, because Chinese have not uh, talked to them anything, you know. So when they reach here in the Dharamsala, they are in high spirit. They are very happy that they are now in freedom, in exile, and they can see the Dalai Lama. And they uh, feel that their future is now bright because they can go to uh, schools and institutions. The children can go to schools and the monks and nuns can go to monasteries to get education. So when they arrive here, they are in high spirit. They are very happy. The youngest are ready to be taken to the city of Tibetan children. A boarding school on the outskirts of Dharamsala, where 2,400 boys and girls between the ages of 9 months and 20 years live and study. Half of them are orphans. The school is divided into individual houses where between 30 and 40 students of all ages live, supervised by a monitor who acts as their mother. In this way, they try to create a family atmosphere with the older ones responsible for looking after and teaching the younger ones. The school was founded in 1960 by a group of nurses led by Tsering Dolma, the eldest sister of the Dalai Lama, in order to provide shelter and education for the children of the first exiles to settle in the province of Kimachal Pradesh, who were then working for the Indian government, building roads in appalling conditions. So the fourth parents, is a very difficult decision, but they know it is better to sort of sacrifice the children and send them into exile, then keep them in Tibet. If they keep the children in Tibet, they see no future for the child. Therefore, they would rather that they do not even see, no matter how emotionally difficult it is, that they do not see, but send them into exile where His Holiness is. Because in exile where His Holiness, there is hope. I mean, Chinese officials, local officials, pressure, pressurize, pressure on the uh, put a lot of pressure on family, so the family is compelled to bring their uh, the children uh, from India. Today, 11,000 Tibetan children receive a good education in the 15 schools scattered around India. For them, a new future lies ahead, far from their country. But here they are happy. They know that the Dalai Lama protects them, and they live in the hope that one day, they'll be able to return to Tibet. An hour's walk from Dramasala stands the Adult Education Center, a very different place from the city of Tibetan children. The center was set up in order to provide a basic education for young people over 20 years old. As soon as they arrive, they are told of the reality of the situation of refugees and the difficulties in finding work in India. For three years, they will be given training in a profession, and the organizers running the center will try to convince them to return to Tibet and put their skills to use there. One of the Dalai Lama's greatest worries is that with the constant flow of refugees, 
his country will one day be entirely empty of Tibetans. Over 300 students live crammed together in old Bestos huts in far from ideal conditions. An additional problem is the mosquitoes, malaria, and the unbearable summer heat, which the Tibetans are not used to, as this center is at an altitude of just 600 meters. Those students that have artistic skills are sent to the Norbulinka Institute, a traditional style building created to conserve and spread Tibetan art and culture. The painting of Tangas is considered one of the major branches of knowledge and its origins go back to the time of Buddha himself. The old masters gradually refined their arts through research and study of the traditions of different countries. The forms of the lines and the tools used in painting have their origins in the Indian style. The drawing of figures is based on the Nepalese style and the background scenes on the Chinese tradition. In a different room, the students learn another of their oldest traditions. Tibetan carpenters are famous for their skill with wood, and this can be seen in the magnificent altars and thrones that decorate their monasteries. The hammer of the master Choi Punsok gradually gives form to a Buddha head. All the figures made here are sent to the many centers that are being built, mainly in the United States and Europe, where the Buddhist religion is gaining many converts. The students undergo a training period of six years, which ensures a good future for them. They are the refugees with the best prospects of finding work. Since the invasion, over 6,000 monasteries have been destroyed in Tibet and religious freedom is very limited. That is why a large percentage of exiles hope to enter one of the monasteries around Dharamsala. The most important of these is the monastery of Namgyal, which is just a few meters from the official residence of the Dalai Lama. Like every afternoon, the 200 monks here gather together in the covered courtyard to discuss Buddhist philosophy. The master throws a series of questions into the air, which the apprentices must discuss. They defend their ideas with such determination that sometimes it almost seems as if they will come to blows. But in fact, it's all entirely good humor. Dharamsala is also the seat of the Tibetan government in exile, with a number of different ministries which coordinate the international campaign against the Beijing government's policy of genocide. Sewan Tetong is the Minister of Information and International Relations, one of the men with most influence over the Dalai Lama and the first Tibetan who studied abroad. Now this office is information and international relations very similar to the Foreign Office. Since we are in exile, it's uh, difficult to call ourselves Foreign Office. But we do the same work as a Foreign Office, keeping relationship with the outside uh, governments, organizations, NGOs, mm -hmm. and as well as the Tibetan community and uh, support groups all over the world. Especially in the last 10 years or so, that Chinese have systematically brought in programs and campaigns to destroy not just the political structure or the political resistance, but also the culture, religion, and identity of Tibetans. Now, that is very dangerous. 
And if we here in the meantime keep saying we want independence, in the meantime, if the Tibetans are killed in Tibet, or if their culture and religion and identities is uh, destroyed, and what is the use of having the land if we do not have our culture, if we do not have people? Similar situation as the native, the aborigines in North America. There are some small groups that are still there, but they've lost their language, they've lost their culture almost, and, and they're just there to perform on some ceremonies, some dance and things but their whole culture of many thousand years have gone. So we are afraid of that might happen to Tibet. In the field of culture and spirituality, they almost something like whether intentionally or unintentionally, some kind of cultural genocide is taking place. On the other hand, you see Tibetan spirit inside Tibet, as I mentioned before, briefly, very high. And then support from the outside world as a result of well, getting uh, how say, uh, better awareness, uh, the support or sympathy, solid, spirit of solidarity also is uh, getting stronger. So therefore things are changing. Many Chinese, outside as well as inside, are very critical about the current Chinese government policy. More and more Chinese now openly supporting about my middle approach. I'm not seeking independence. I'm not seeking separation from the People's Republic of China. Within the People's Republic of China, genuine self-rule. That I consider best way uh, for, let's say, safeguard of Tibetan cultural heritage as well as Buddhist spirituality. And also, the, I think, best safeguard for unity and stability. To the north of Dharamsala, deep in the heart of the Indian Himalayas, isolated from the outside world, lies a valley in which the essence of Tibetan spirituality and culture is conserved. This valley is known as Little Tibet. Either side of the Ladakh Valley rise high arid barren mountains crossed by the Indus River. The name Ladakh comes from the Tibetan Ladwags, which means the land of the passes. At this point, the river is fast flowing, running north towards the region of Baltistan and then into the fertile valleys of neighboring Pakistan, across the deep gorges sculpted by the force of its waters, transforming the landscape into a world of incredible surreal forms. The villages and hamlets stand among fields of crops planted on any available land in this vertical world. The Ladakhis take advantage of every last piece of fertile land, and at the end of April, when spring is about to arrive, the farmers helped by the yaks get the soil ready to sow the barley. For both the Ladakhis and the nomads, the yak is essential in their lives. The dung provides the vital fuel for cooking and heating their houses during the long cold winters. The milk and meat are a basic part of their diet. With the skins they make clothes and their tents. They are their means of transport and the goods that they trade. The houses are solid constructions in Tibetan style arranged around the monastery. 
Their thick walls give them a robust appearance, despite the poverty and the lack of materials in the region. On the rooftops are the latrines and the larders in which they store the grass to feed the cattle. Inside, the kitchen is the main room where family life takes place. Here, they not only cook, but also eat and sleep by the heat of the fire. Leh is the capital of the Ladakh Valley. The city is presided over by a castle of nine stories built on a slope of the hill, and though its walls are well conserved, the interior has been ruined and abandoned since 1942 when the Dogra Hindu dynasty annexed the Ladakh Valley to the provinces of Yamur and Kashmir. The small bustling city of 25,000 inhabitants traditionally based its prosperity on the trade in tea, salt, carpets and wooden sculptures, which were sold to the republics of Central Asia and the bazaars of Kashgar or Samarkand. Today, Leh is an important strategic center for India. The strong military presence is a reminder that the Ladakh Valley runs along the disputed border with China and Pakistan. The character of the city has also changed since the valley was opened to tourists in 1974. Since then, over 100 small hotels have been built and the businesses of the main bazaar have been turned into souvenir shops. But still, Leh conserves that atmosphere of a remote, isolated city, which for nine months a year is cut off from the outside world by the snow. Around the Chortens, the Ladakhis gather to begin a pilgrimage. In such a mountainous country where there are virtually no roads or motor vehicles, walking long distances is part of life, and visiting the sacred places scattered along the routes is a good way to accumulate merits. For the majority of Tibetans, their natural surroundings are full of sacred visions and places of power. The mountains can be seen as mandala images, the rocks reach spiritual dimensions, and the land is full of supernatural powers. Under the guidance of the great Lama, the pilgrims get ready to begin the three-day journey to the monastery of Leh. Pilgrimage is not just a question of walking to a sacred place and then returning home. Performing chaktsal or prostrations along the route is the best way to demonstrate your devotion. These prostrations follow a fixed sequence. First they clap their hands above their heads, then touch their foreheads and hearts before assuming a position similar to that of Muslims when they pray, and finally lying flat out on the ground with the arms outstretched. The first Buddhist monasteries in Ladakh were founded by pilgrims on their way to Mount Kailas, the most sacred place of all for Tibetans. One of the most important monasteries is that of Tikse. This magnificent architectural complex stands on a low hill 17 kilometers upriver from Leh. The monastery was founded in the 15th century by the Gelupka order, popularly known as Yellow Caps.
Inside, the walls are decorated with magnificent, well-conserved friezes from the 16th and 17th centuries, depicting scenes from monastic life and images of terrible deities. Alongside them, the manuscripts that contain the mantras written on sheets of rice paper are kept in small niches and protected by boards and multicolored cloths. The sound of the gong and the trumpets announces the start of prayer. Buddhism arrived in Ladakh in the second century BC and a thousand years later it was adopted in neighboring Tibet. With a slow, monotonous rhythm, the monks recite the mantras, the prayers to Buddha. Reciting the mantras, they try to free themselves from desires and senses and develop the qualities of conscience, goodness and wisdom. More than a religion, Buddhism is a philosophy or a path. Its aim is to eradicate the pain which is inseparable from existence, shaking free earthly ties through moderation, renunciation and meditation. In short, to reach Nirvana. This state was reached by Buddha 2,500 years ago. Buddha means someone who is awake and is the achievement of a man called Siddhartha Gautama who was born in southern Nepal. At the age of 35, after deep meditation, he reached the state of illumination. The rest of his life he spent traveling and spreading his teachings. At the foot of the Tixay Monastery, a group of Chortans indicates one of the most sacred places in the valley. They were built by the royal family in order to fulfill the worthy acts prescribed by Buddhism. The Chortans generally contain the relics and sacred objects of a saint. Today is the most important day in the year for the monks of Lamayuru. In just a few hours, the annual festival of the dances called Cham will begin. From the first light of the morning, the Ladakhis who have come from all corners of the valley gather in the courtyard of the monastery known as the Chamra, the place for dancing. While traditional music plays, the people find the best spot from which to observe the spectacle. No one wants to miss this great event which is so important in the life of these people. Meanwhile, in a nearby room, the dancing monks make their final preparations. <laughs> Yeah. 
the sound of the clarinets announces that the dance is about to begin. The cham was introduced into Nepal along with Tibetan Buddhism in the 16th century, and its dances represent Buddhists' fear of demons and monstrous creatures, though some anthropologists see the cham as a metaphor of the gradual conquest of the ego, the ultimate aim of Buddhism. This solemn dance, which lasts two days, each movement has a meaning, represents one of the manifestations of the protecting gods who seek to destroy evil spirits. These have their origin in the Bon Chos, the animist religion which preceded Buddhism. hold a small bowl in the shape of a caravel in which they trap the evil spirits and supernatural forces. It is these that cause fires, floods, drought, hunger and earthquakes. As evening falls, peace returns to Lama Yuru. As every afternoon, Dorsen Sering, the abbot of the monastery, comes out onto the terrace to watch the sun set over the mountains, while he tries to imagine what is happening in the land beyond those peaks. Since he left Tibet 11 years ago, Dorsen has had no news of his family who continue to live in a small village in the west of the country nor has he heard anything of the monks of his monastery with whom he shared 40 years of his life. But like the majority of refugees, he does not lose hope that one day they'll be able to return to Tibet. As long as the Dalai Lama remains alive, the flame of the Tibetan cause will not go out. <laughs> 